I do love that last piece that was said that if, like me, you come from a family that could be a good family, maybe not a great family, could have been a rocky family, a hard family, some tough decisions made, there's always opportunities for us to increase and grow the next generation. And a big one that any of us can do is to serve. And when your kids see you serving, it does make a difference. They do see something. Some of y'all were raised watching your parents do that, and that's why you do it today, okay? Some of you, you didn't, and so there's an opportunity to really to embrace some humility, to grow. I love the fact that we have a church filled with people that do uh, volunteer their time efforts a lot. Sometimes people from very um, upper echelon jobs do the most simple things in our body. And that's a super fun to see, okay? So, all right, y'all, Acts 14 today. We're gonna be verses 21 through 28. Um, The title of the the sermon is How to Plant a Church. Now, we planted, Selena and I started planting churches 2007 uh, in the Rio Grande Valley. We did not know what we were doing. I had just come to Christ a few years before, um, started teaching the Bible because the Bible was radically changing and wrecking my life. So I thought I'd share, I mean, it was, it was really good news to me. And so I wanted to talk about it and I, we just saw crazy things happen. I taught a Bible study called X Life and people would come uh, and we would just teach the Bible and they began to say like, well, is, this is our church. Should we tithe here? I'm like, no, no, no. It was like a Thursday night Bible study. Like, no, no, no. You, you go to a church on Sunday. I'm not going to be a pastor. Pastors are, you know, those are good people. I'm not really a good person. I'm, I'm just saved. And so I'm just going to lead on Thursday. And man, the more I read the Bible, the more I thought, maybe, maybe we're called to plant church. And so we did it 2008. Uh, with few people in a house. I remember there was probably six of us uh, and the worship guy really knew more than I did. And I said, I'm just gonna lay sit on the couch, teach from the couch. He's like, nah, dude, get up there and preach. And so I, I preached in a living room, like with the podium to six people sitting on couches for like 55 minutes, I just preached. And, and the next week, like uh, we had 100% increase. We were up to like 10 people. And the next week, we had a few people that were sitting like in the, in the hallway. Um, one dude had really just come in from partying the night before. I thought he was going to fall off the stool. Uh, my wife was in the back. We had folks coming in, and we just started teaching the Bible and, uh, and trying to grow the local body. And so maybe, maybe some of you feel called to plant a church one day. I want you to know we're about that here like we're already looking at different parts in San Antonio. Uh, when I taught the parenting class this morning at the 8.30, a local pastor named Al came in and preached for me at 8.30. I love him so much. He's got a great church called The Well. You can look him up. Like we want to be open-handed with healthy church that we can be a part of what God has called us to be a part of. So um, I've been in business sector for a long time. I've been in ministry. I still do a little bit of business coaching as I was studying these points that I'm going to make today from the scripture about how to plan a church. I realized that all five of them work for business as well. Like this, it's phenomenal to me how much in private sector, if people just looked at the precepts of the Bible, how much better their business can be. All right. So I'll I'll point those out to you later, but here's the five things we're gonna cover today. The church is called to evangelize, all right? Um, This means that we go share good news. We're called to make disciples. Explain to you what that is today. We're called to appoint leadership, elders. And Friday night, as you guys are maybe doing date nights or putting kids down after a long week, the elders were meeting at a local hotel to have dinner together, break bread together, stay up late together, get up early together, and plan, dream, and pray. Um, because we take our leadership seriously. We're called to appoint elders. We're called to gather and encourage I'm at a place in my ministerial life right now. If I were to go back into private sector, I would not hire someone who is not an encourager. I'm not gonna do it. I don't care how good you are. If you cannot encourage, I don't want you on my team. The Bible calls us to encourage one another. 
and to care for one another. It's a big deal. And the last thing that the church does, and we'll see this in chapters today, is spend time together. I don't know why. As Christians, we're deficit in this regard. We're not spending enough time together. Now, some of y'all do, but our cultural paradigm in the United States teaches us what are, what are our greatest values. We're supposed to work harder than anybody. That's why we have heart issues through the roof. The rest of the world laughs at how we work here, by the way. They think it's hilarious, okay? Talk to somebody from Britain or from Australia about how they do vacation and how we do vacation, all right? Uh, what's another value? Well, the greatest value past how hard you work is yourself. As long as it's about you, then you do what you have been called to do, and it's contrary to what the church has been called to do. We're called to meet together. When's the last time you've had people in your house for a meal? Some of y'all was this weekend. Some of y'all was a long time, okay? We're called to care and love. When's the last time you asked somebody out if you don't want to feed them in your home? Have you, have you spent some time with them? When's the last time you've had a coffee with somebody with no other agenda than just to talk? When is the last time you've just talked about a verse that the Holy Spirit is using to wreck your life? The the church needs to spend time together, not just be at war with each other all the time. And we, listen, this is a spiritual war. This is hard. This is heavy if we're going to do church right. So because it's so hard, I want to make sure I have time with you guys. And y'all have time with me. And we get past the, the pretenses into knowing how to care and love one another. Plant the church. Now, um, we are a church with the big C, I like to say. We're, we're, we're Christ's church internationally and uh, throughout all time. And so if we, if we were to be able to leave this place and go to Kenya right now, there's certain churches that I could take you to that could show you the body of Christ in Africa. And they sound different than us and they look differently than us, but they worship the same God. We are unified under the gospel of Jesus Christ worldwide. Okay, now we mission our church with the small c. We are the local expression of what God has called us to be. And this is a beautiful thing. Um, some of y'all have kids. Uh, sometimes kids are like little, they look like their siblings, family. You know, you have those families that this is, everybody is very strong, genetic pull, they all look like. Sometimes you have kids that are radically different than one another. Some of you are married, you're radically different than your spouse. Some of the men are just looking straight ahead, not moving right now at all. They're not sure what to do with that. Um, but what we see in the church is that the church is allowed to be different, yet unified under Scripture, okay? So our girls growing up, they could really wear whatever they wanted to wear as long as they had on clothes. That was our only criterion, okay? And Carolina sometime could talk about her. She's not here. She would show up in like a tutu with some boots on, and a gardening hat and a baby doll that did that, you know, that had weird something on. And our response was like, you look great, let's go, okay? Because that was her expression and I'm all about that. But when it came to spiritual things as a family, we were very unified. So uh, look around right now, you have some of y'all like, I don't know where you're gonna go to eat for lunch today. Some of y'all are gonna go to specific restaurants and lean into your specific type of food. Think about us as a church, that we are connected with other churches around San Antonio right now. And the connection is Jesus Christ and him crucified. The connection is no man comes to the Father but through Jesus. The connection is the blood saves. The connection is, is that Christ is the one that saves and we are, we are sanctified as we go together. This is the discipleship we'll talk about in a minute. But everything else is a little different, okay? So we're the expression local church. All right, Acts 14, 21. Uh, Lord, bless us today. Speak to us as only you can. Open our eyes that we might see. Thank you for everybody's presence here. Holy Spirit, we embrace you. We ask that you would fill this room with your presence. We rebuke and stand against the enemy and all his works and effects. I thank you for all the volunteers that faithfully serve Mission Church and your, your church with the big C. In your name we pray, amen. Verse 21, got a lot to cover. After they had preached the gospel in that town and made many disciples... They returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch. The first thing that we see in this passage, the first part of the outline, how do you plant the church, is you evangelize. 
verse 21. We're called to share the gospel. Now, evangelism will always lead to discipleship. Always lead to discipleship. We see this from scripture. Ephesians 4.11 says this. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. So evangelism is for the justification of the heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. We share the truth. We talk about Jesus. We present it in an unadulterated way. You don't have to dress it up. It's not gospel and it's Jesus plus nothing. That is what we offer. Um, I, I got to share the gospel several times this past week. Had lunch with a new friend. He's here today. Um, I had a, a couple inside our gym that um, I've been praying for this guy specifically for a while. And uh, the Holy Spirit was like, you need to talk to him? I'm like, Lord, I and it, it's, all, it's always an issue, right? So I'm like, I don't know. Okay. So he had his headphones on. And how do you get somebody's attention when you're in the sauna? You just got to... He's like, oh, I'm sorry, boss. Can I help you? And I said, were you in the Navy? And I have no idea why I said that. Because he didn't have a Navy. He said, I was for four years. And I then said out loud to him, I don't know why I asked you that. I just, okay, now that it's weird, I'll tell you about Jesus, you know? <laughs> and he, his wife came in. He introduced me to her. And he's a super nice guy. And uh, I just, uh, he said, are you that preacher guy? And I said, I think there's a few of them here, but what are we talking about? He said, my friend told me about you. I didn't know who you were, and it's good to meet you. And conversation, and one of the things she said later in the conversation was like, you know, religions, they just lead to the same God. And when you hear that, you either are going to, with love and care, tell the truth, or you can just compromise and win them with your emotional care. The second one is heresy, okay? The first one is with love and care. You don't fight or debate, but I said, man, I hear you on that, that you understand how that makes sense to you. Um, would you be interested to know what the Bible says about what you just said? She said, yeah. So I shared with her and I talked about how Jesus said himself that I am the way. And no man, Jesus literally said, there's no other way but me. She's like, wow, I've never heard that before. I said, anytime y'all would like to go to lunch or dinner, I would love to talk to you about the beauty of the gospel. You have to evangelize, I have to evangelize, okay? Now, evangelism is a word only found in two other verses. I listed those in the notes today. It just means bringer of good tidings, a bringer of the gospel, okay? It doesn't mean that you have to be ready to, de to debate. If you can do it in love, it's great. But it just means that you have to be ready to share good news. Uh, apostles and prophets, as they were found in the Old Testament, are not present anymore, okay? Men can be apostolic. There's no question about that. You can have apostolic gifts, but in terms of an apostle of today, the apostles of the day were one touch from Jesus, okay? They knew Jesus. Um, apostolic, we do. Um, <clears throat> I believe in miracles. I believe in tongues. I believe in those things. You can have the power through the Holy Spirit to see somebody healed, but you're not a healer as the apostles were. Um, not by title. This transitioned into pastors and teachers. So what we see in the church today is that pastors and teachers, uh, lay members, members of the church as we know it, were called to be evangelistic. And some of us have sequestered that on others and said they're the ones that are called to do it, not me. Uh, evangelism also is not an entity by itself. You don't get to go to a people group, share, and then drop the mic and leave. Okay. Now, randomly, I've shared Christ a lot. A lot of our missionaries have. I see several of you. Y'all have shared the gospel all around the world. I understand. But the importance and value of discipleship needs to be elevated. That we're not trying just to tell people something about our Savior. We're trying to introduce them to other people that know the Savior. We're trying to bring them into a community where they can chop it up on a regular basis and they can grow. That is discipleship. Um, evangelism is a calling to the unregenerate by a holy God to repent and be saved. When is the last time you've used the word repent? It's a beautiful word. 
Like this is really some of the elders, what we're doing Friday night was spending time in repentance. How can we care? How can, what's the sin we need to turn from? Where can we turn from bad habits or bad choices or uh, emotional constructions that are happening in our own lives all the time that cause conflict, anger, and issue so that we can love, care, and forgive. Evangelism is a calling to the unregenerate by a holy God to repent and be saved. Discipleship is a calling to the newly regenerated to continue repentance and be changed forever. So it's, it's not enough, I would submit to you, to say, let me tell you the good news of Jesus, mic drop, and I'm out. What we do is, let me tell you the good news of Jesus, let's grab hands and learn together. How can we connect you to a local body? How can we put you in a discipleship group? How can we um, bring you into a community? One of my new friends came this morning. I introduced him to like five people. Why? Because I really like y'all. Most of y'all, I really like y'all, you know? (laughs) I do, I love you. And so the body of Christ is not one or two, it's all of us. There is safety here. Safety is in numbers. Evangelism is what? It's a calling to be saved. Discipleship is what? A calling to change. We cannot say as believers, well, it's just who I am. It's just like, People just need to know that's just who I am. It's not biblical saying that. So what does evangelism look like practically? Talking about Jesus to your neighbor. When's the last time? Now listen, you don't have to come out of your house and go, hey, neighbor, have you heard the good news of Jesus Christ? Although it's not a bad idea, maybe it works in your neighborhood, Okay. But they need to know who you are. Do your neighbors know your believers? Well, yeah, Pastor Tom, we put a Christmas tree in the yard every December. That's not like, do they know your Christians by your love? Are you caring for them? Do they know who you are? Uh, local outreach. We've done a good bit of local outreach. A lot of y'all are part of that. Let me encourage you as we do more local events, come and be uncomfortable. That's really what evangelism is. It's you're uncomfortable, okay? But you're uncomfortable for a really great cause. Prison ministry, we've just gotten that off the ground. If you're interested, come talk to me. Uh, The guy that leads prison ministry will be here in the next service. Uh, Gym conversations, it's one of my favorite. It's a warm market for me. Jacuzzi evangelism, you know? Sauna expressions, I don't know what you wanna call it, but I see a lot of people in there. Workplace conversations. I was at a, I was at a, in, in town conference four years ago. And one of our guys, brilliant dude, had invited me to be, he doesn't go, go to Michigan anymore. I'm hanging out with him in the hall. He's one of the speakers and uh, some of the power brokers come through and the gentleman introduced us to them. And he said, yeah, this is my pastor and this is some of the leaders. And the guy said to my friend, you're a Christian? I didn't know you were a Christian. Ooh, that's indicting, isn't it? Man, listen, the people you work with, they should know that you love the Lord, all right? They should know it. You don't have to go hammer down on them. That's not what we do. But man, they should actually enjoy the fact that you are. Your, de- your desire should be that people in your workplace say, I'm not a Christian like she or he is, but I, like the f- I believe that they believe that. I I really see them live it out. Uh, Kid conversations. Kid conversations, not only with your own. You know, I've told you all this before. Two of my children came to Christ at Chick-fil-A. Coincidence? I don't think so. That's God's chicken. Amen. All right. Um, We have conversations, gospel conversations with them all the time. Last night, uh, our youngest is now almost 13. Like we're going to have all three teenagers for like a little split minute before one turns 20. And uh, last night I'm hanging out in the kitchen with all three kids and we're laughing and and Selena and I are both in there. And my heart was so stinking filled with joy. I could hardly see straight. Everybody can go to the bathroom by themselves. They feed themselves. They can put on their own clothes. They study. They go to bed by themselves. It's Nirvana. Okay. You'll get there, parents, I promise. But you do the work, and then you have the value. And we talk about Jesus, not like, well, kids, get out your Bibles. You know, it's it's Saturday night. We're doing Bible drills. Um, We don't do that. Talking about Jesus for us is a flow because we really do love him. I share when I talk about Jesus at the gym with my daughters, like, well, Dad, then what happened? Then what'd you do? And they do that too. 
something we do together. Server conversations. I love to pray for waiters and waitresses. It's super fun. You add in what evangelism should be. This is simply you're overflowing what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life, all right? Uh, number two, verse 21 also talks about discipling. We are called as a church to disciple. Now, evangelism works hand in hand with discipleship always. It should be never separate. There should always be the goal of the evangelist to put that person in connection with the local body or if they can themselves spend that time. Um, never separate. What I see sometimes is uh, certain Christians will only do Bible study with the body of Christ. We just need to go deeper, Pastor. We're, like, we're really going deep. Yeah, you're going deep by yourself. The, these things you're learning, who are you sharing them with? If you're, not, if you're not evangelizing and discipling and you've just been studying the scripture by yourself for years, you're selfish. You, if it's good news, why aren't you sharing it? See, we need to understand as the church that when we keep the gospel, we're stealing because it's been given to us to be given away. And if you're not given away, that's a problem. Uh, or you can go completely the opposite, only evangelism with non-believers. You're just with non-believers all the time. You're going to share the gospel all the time. Well, you're probably exhausted. You need some time with the brothers and sisters where y'all can giggle and laugh. The elders and myself, we laughed till my stomach hurt this past 24 hours. We had such a great time, such a great dinner. Man, we really love those brothers. We talked about hard things Saturday. What do we need to do? Where are we headed? What's going on? The real church evangelizes all the time to draw people into discipleship lifestyle community. It's a point. You know, so one of the brothers I had dinner with this week, really, really enjoyed my time with him. And I wanted him to know in our conversation Bro, if you don't have a church, I'd love you to come to mission. But if you want to go to another church, that's fine too. Like it's not a us and no more type thing. Like I like to know good people. And there's a lot of good people in San Antonio. So what does discipleship look like if we're going to break that out a little bit? Intentional small group Bible study. All right. We do it all over the city. Uh, we're having job uh, work fair this, volunteer fair this week. We have discipleship groups coming up. You have to be a part of one if you're not. You really do. You, you'll, you'll thank me. At Christmas time, you'll say, thank you, Pastor Tom. I don't, that's not a religious thing. I am enjoying iron sharpening iron. I am enjoying learning scripture to God. I'm enjoying training with one another. Everybody I know in martial arts trains with other people. Two of my friends that are very high level. I saw them on Facebook. They were at some public event in McAllen and they, start, they started rolling like at a, like a public event because that's what they do. They train all the time, okay? It, biblically, we're called to train all the time. Different perspectives of people grow who you are. And let me tell you something. Hanging out with non-believers or new believers and hearing what they have to say about scripture will grow you exponentially. It'll force you to answer hard questions and also get to see the beauty through their eyes as they see biblical precepts for the first time. It's like riding on a plane with a five-year-old, right? Like most of us have flown a thousand times. We go to sleep on takeoff. My daughters, when they first flow, they're like, dad, we're gonna fly. <laughs> yeah, we are. Like, you're totally right. We're about to fly. It's crazy. And they would look at the window and they would be excited. We want to be excited. Um, Precept application to real life situations. Because the Bible says this, we respond in a certain way. We come under the authority of Christ. We don't see the gospel from a distance. We don't witness who Christ was and be like, yeah, that's great. And come to church on Sunday and we see him in the distance. And then we walk away and do what we're called to do. No, we're learning about somebody that loves us and will walk out the door with us today, holding our hand, caring for us. I had to discipline our, one of our children a little while back. And uh, what Selena and I do is if one of us is not present, we'll have that child explain to the other parent what happened. Any of y'all's parents ever do that? Stinking brutal, okay? You have to sit down with that parent and you're just like, oh. And so Mary sat down with me and she began to talk to me and she was nervous about sharing with me. I already knew what happened because we talk. Selena and I talk all the time. But I just stopped her and I said, hey, listen, just stop I, before you even tell me anything. I just need you to know, child, I'm never gonna leave you. I'm never gonna walk away from you. 
and there is nothing you can do and nothing can be done to you that will ever cause me to walk away from you. Do you understand me? I love you. And she, (sighs) and then we had a conversation, okay? Um, Discipleship is important, but if we're not changing in the process, we're not hearing the precepts for what they are, it's training opportunities, it's growth opportunities. You should be a little uncomfortable in terms of things that you're struggling with right now. Everybody that trains or grows good in anything, it will cost you. Discipleship's the same. Here's why Paul says to the church in Ephesus 4.25, therefore, putting away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. Discipleship at its essence is telling the truth about your sinful condition. It's letting other people know that you struggle, that you have problems, that you have issues too, and this is where you band together, okay? Like soldiers on the battlefield, like parents, when you come together because, you know, you had one kid and that was a zone and now it's three and you don't know what to do, they outnumber you, you come together, okay? You connect and you serve and you love together. Back to the passage, 22. Strengthening the disciples by encouraging them to continue in the faith and by telling them it is necessary to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church and prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. The third thing that we do as leaders is we appoint elders. Okay, elders are a big deal to us. We have uh, several elders in our church. We're interested in having more. Uh, we can talk about the, the calling of the elder himself. But elder pastors are called to pastor, provide, and protect the church. Our deacons do this process too. It's a huge deal. Uh, Acts 20 says this, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers. That's another word. It can be interchangeable for, for pastor, for elder. To shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So what does eldership look like? Uh, it's preaching and teaching. It's discipleship. It's theological care, like literally the elders will sit around and we will talk about issues maybe that are coming uh, to the church. Um, things like... Uh, I, the litany, we, we want to be biblical. We want to make sure that we're leading you guys in a way that is Bible-directed and gospel-focused. And so we have these conversations. Uh, also, discipline and counsel. We do a lot of counsel. Uh, we do a lot of lay counseling through our coaching and through our discipleship. We also do discipline. There are times when we as elders, as shepherds, have to step in, and that's never fun. Uh, But I've had to tell specific people at certain times, like, hey, this has been brought to our attention. Like, is this true or not? The first statement is always, how can I help you? How can I serve you? Like, listen, I'm a sinner like you. How can I help you in this situation with your spouse? How can I help you in this situation with your children? How can I help you in a hard situation you're with the IRS or the government or your boss or whatever? We want to serve. The church needs to run more to the problem instead of away from it. At that juncture, sometimes uh, people dig their heels in and they don't want to respond. And so there is a time when, when elders must do church discipline. It's a real thing. Verse 24, they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. After they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From there, they sailed back to Antioch where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. After they arrived and gathered the church together, gathered the church, they reported everything God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. The fourth thing you do when you plant the church is you gather and you encourage It's just that simple. We don't need any more leaders to have super high, um, strong, anointed platforms. Okay? Believers are anointed. We need men and women that are hungry for the truth. Therefore, they want to talk about it. Therefore, they want to live it. They want to walk it out in their marriage. They want to walk it out in their leadership of their children and with their neighbors. Okay? Um, We gather together as broken people. 
uh, and we have lunch. We, uh, we have some baptisms after the 11.30. Today, we're gonna break bread with, with Abram and Melly, our new uh, youth directors. We can love and serve them. We're gonna gather with families that have fifth graders to 12th graders. We're gonna do the things. And in that, you get to know one another. In that, you may get to know somebody across the table that you didn't realize how funny they were. You just thought that person was always serious because they look so serious in church. We have some very serious looking people at mission who are stinking hilarious if you just allow them to be, all right? We have people that love to give and serve and be patient. And this is the calling of the body to do together. And we are called to encourage one another. Lord knows the world is hard enough as it is right now. I want to encourage you. I want to see really cool things come out of your family. I want to see change. I want you to see change in me. I don't want any of us to be under the disillusion that um, you're perfect or I'm perfect. Ain't that garbage? Let's talk about reality and how we can serve and, and care and love one another. This is the church with the little C, the local church. So what Paul and Barnabas had done is they had started uh, in the Jerusalem area. Uh, they basically, that had exploded. They had gone to Antioch. That church had exploded. They had, what had they done? They had raised up leaders so the leaders could do what? Disciple and care for the people. And then they as leaders went to uh, the island. They went up into other cities. Uh, they've had some very hard times. A lot of violence has, has been pushed upon them. And their response is to continue to share and encourage. And now they're coming back to the, to the church they started in to do what? To receive accolades? To be honored? To be glorified? No to gather and continue to do the things. We gather, we speak, we care, and they gather to tell them, hey, here's what's going on. So whenever, um, by the grace of God, I pray that our missions can get off the ground again this year. We're super excited about that. Anything we do in the field, you'll see here. Whenever missionaries are stateside, you'll see them here. As stories happen, as there are baptisms this fall, uh, you'll see them here. Why? Because we want to share with you what's going on. We don't want to keep any part of the church sequestered. Now, some places we're, we're uh, working around the world, we can't talk about what they're doing openly. Uh, but we do have two missionaries right now that just arrived in Thailand. That's an open country. They're ready. I think we're going to do like a Zoom call with them in a little bit. Cause, why? Because we want you guys, the church, we're supporting them. We're helping them to see what they're doing. And then we want to go and serve them. Again, different expressions, local church, just like different humans, right? Different food, different ways to exercise, different TV shows you guys like, different ideologies. Um, Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together, some are in the habit of doing, but encourage each other. And all the more as you see the day approaching. We gather, we worship, we, we praise the Lord, we, we're thankful, we, we observe the sacraments. Um, in, the, in the upcoming weeks, you're going to see a couple reaffirm their, their marriage vows right here in the worship service. Um, that, that's always super fun for me. I really enjoy that. Why is that important? Because they want to do it in front of you. That's the reason. They want to do it in front of you. They, the Lord has done a work in their life. So now they're, they're resetting, refocusing. This is what the church is called to do together. So what does the local church do? Church with a small C. It preaches the word. Um, like I said, Pastor Al preached the 830 for me this morning. He did a phenomenal job. I get to preach. I love doing that. Pastor Daniel, when he preaches, he does a phenomenal job. We have a team of preachers now. The mission hasn't had before. We're going specifically to a conference at the end of October in Austin just so we can learn how to preach the word. Why? Because it's important and it's valuable and I love it. Um, we preach the word. We uh, teach precept and practicum. It's very important to explain to new believers and new parents and, and, and newlyweds. This is how you do things. 
it's not enough. Uh, first thing I said to one of the guys I started discipling when he came to Christ and our church plant in the valley is, you need to die for your wife. He's like, okay. And he left. And he literally drove back up 30 minutes later and came back into my office and said, how do I do that? I'm like, oh no, let me think about it. Because I knew I was supposed to make the statement. But right, then you can't tell your kids if they've never made their bed, go make your bed. Like, I don't know how to make my bed. Like you have to teach them. And discipleship is a process of teaching people very simple practicum. Uh, I've taught guys how to write resumes before. I've told some dudes before that I've discipled, hey, you need to brush your teeth. Hey, <laughs> discipleship 101, okay? Uh, if you ever want to get married and you not live by yourself, let's they start right there, brother, okay? Um, I've taught guys how to shake hands. Uh, we, we've empowered, my wife has empowered a ton of women, like, hey, we know where you come from. You are a child of God. You're a strong young woman. You're empowered, Okay? That's what Emma said the first time I took her shooting after she knocked off one clip. How do you feel? She's like, empowered. <laughs> All right, Clint Eastwood, that's cool. We teach precepts and practicum to one another. We have hacks. 8.30 class, if you didn't come to it this week, you want to come. Pastor Jesse is right. It's all standalone. So come learn some, some ways to strengthen your marriage so you can strengthen your parenting next Sunday if you want to join us. We equip one another. Uh, we observe sacraments, baptism, Lord's Supper. We'll do that today. Marriage, ordination, sending missionaries. It's super fun. Verse 28, and they spent a considerable time with the disciples. Paul and Barnabas came back from the road. They're coming back into the, the new cool church that has different colored leaders, different demographic backgrounds. The church is exploding there. It's starting to get persecuted. There's some issues going on. And they come in not to say, I, we just need some time by ourselves, which is what a lot of us would do. It's probably what I would want to do. They come in and scripture says they spent not some time with the disciples, a considerable amount of time with the disciples. The best parts about being raised in my parents' home is they had a lot of people in. This was, uh, you know, early 80s, 70s, where we didn't have cell phones yet, where the phone was still this giant thing that was in your kitchen. And when you took calls as a teenager, you would take that phone as far away as you could with the cord into the closet or whatever to talk. And my parents would have these people over for dinner and it would be a sit down dinner. And I remember wanting to stay in the adult space. The kids would go off and play. And I always wanted to stay because they talked about things on a level that I was just impressed with. And I saw them love one another. I saw my father ask questions. I saw my mother serve. I saw them have these wonderful conversations with missionaries and other families that were different than ours in our home. And it blessed me as a child. I wanted that. We must, church, we must get back to this. We can't not do it, all right? I'm not interested in going to another restaurant where there are TVs in front of me and behind me. It's like the Disney movie Wally, okay? That's what it reminds me of. That's where we're headed. We have to get back to this. Just connection. How are you doing? What's going on? Tell me about your week. And I don't have to leave. The only place I need to be here is right here. Let's have some more coffee and let's talk about your story. I heard one guy's story this week. It was fascinating. Made me want to hang out with him more so I can hear more of his story. Why? Because stories matter. They reflect who we are. They tell our, they tell our history. Spend time together. Church needs to be with one another. We need to hang out more. And when this happens, there's deeper relationships. You're more apt to call somebody that you know than when you don't know them, right? I mean, that makes sense, okay? The more you know somebody, the more they're able maybe to access help from you as well as you from them. Uh, 1 John 1, 7 through 8, we'll finish up with this. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, Jesus, the light, we have fellowship, quinonia, with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. One of the attributes and value of community is that through Jesus, it's cleansing. 
And so if you wonder why you get twisted when you're by yourself, it's because you're by yourself, all right? Robinson Crusoe, you ever read that book? It's actually a book, not just a movie. You can read the words about how he starts going nutty in his brain. I'm an introvert. I love to be by myself. I really, I love, my, I love being by myself. And after about the second day, I begin to get weird, okay? In my mind, I do. What I need is I need to be around other believers. Why? Because it's cleansing. I can see and look left to the right and realize, golly, in my mind, I had just persecuted my own soul about the 10 things that are wrong with me. Now I can, I'm in a community where we're all struggling with something. And to struggle communally is actually encouraging. Isn't it? It's encouraging because you're not the only one. You're not the only one. The marriage class that we did, the marriage and parenting class this morning, as my wife and I are talking about hard pieces, we, we see you guys respond, okay? Usually the women, when you talk about hard things, their response is like, yeah, he needs to hear this. That's how women respond. Men respond like this. They don't move, but their eyes do, and they're like, checking out if anybody else is paying attention, okay? We understand that. We struggle too. That's why we talk about our own stuff. And what community is, is an opportunity for regenerated people to continue the process of changing forever, changing generations. We walk in fellowship when we are in the light. Community is cleansing you feel great when you leave DGCG. How many of y'all this past year, those of y'all that are in DGCG, uh, discipleship groups, community groups, raise your hands. Raise them up high, okay? We're not at an Amway convention. You can raise your hands. Um, okay, how many of y'all would say this past year that you have a discipleship group to go to or a community group? It's like 334. It's an hour or two before you have to go. What, does, what, what do you think inside? I don't wanna go. I'm tired. I'm not going to go. I don't want to go. Or even you have the conversation with your spouse, of his community group. Do you want to go? I'm not sure I want. I'm kind of tired. <coughs> I feel a little sick in my throat. <laughs> One of the kids. The kids are some of the wrong kids. We shouldn't go. And then you go. You go. How do you feel on the way home? Yeah. Boop. Yeah. You walk away going... Man, I love our community group so much. It's amazing. I love these people. And two hours ago, you were looking for a way to get out of it. it why? Because biblically, we see right here in 1 John, the fellowship is cleansing. There's something that washes us, all right? Um, I'm very excited about community groups this semester. I'm very excited about community groups. There's some specific ones that are coming back into the mix that I just love. Like, man, there's so many opportunities to love and serve people, and this is the best way to do it. Uh, why do we need community? Because we're sinners. That's the reason. You're a sinner, all right? You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We need community. So on your way to DGs and CGs this fall, you can literally say, I'm going to meet with these people because I am a sinner and I want to walk in the light. I'm either going to embrace my own darkness because I can figure it out. I, I'm in control. I can do it. No, you can't. You won't. It'll get darker. Or you can come to a place where the light is going to be glorified and made much of and the name of Jesus is going to be used and you can just feel that washing. That's what community is for. This is how you plant the church. We're all called to evangelize. We're all called to disciple, okay? Um, we're all called to have leadership that we can work with, grow with. We're called to gather and encourage. Please, just I dare you, encourage two people on the way out today. Sounds so hokey, I know, but I don't care. We need to do it. You need to do it. I need to do it. We need to encourage more, okay? Um, and then we need to spend time together. We need to spend more time in the kitchen, hanging out, just talking. We need to spend more time at the dinner table, just listening to stories and enjoying one another. This is encouraging. This is the family of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, uh, thanks for this day. 
Thank, thanks for your church with the big C. Lord, we, you are our senior pastor. You are the Lord. You are the only one that can save us, Lord. You are the only one, and you use people, but you're the only one that can disciple us through your word. Uh, Father, you call us as broken people to share the gospel, tell the truth about good news, and then to spend time with people. That's what discipleship is. Working uh, in the regenerated lives to be changed forever. Let's so open our eyes that we might see. Prepare us for uh, your, 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 the Lord's Supper. As we take the juice, Lord, we remember your blood. As we take the bread, we remember your body broken for us. In your name we pray. Jesus, amen. Church, when you're ready, come forward.